I can vividly remember reading my first Kim Adonizio poem in grad school and feeling like I was just punched in the face in the best of ways. <laughs> I knew at that moment my own writing would never be the same because here finally was a poet who was doing what I wanted to do. Not only learn, but master every single rule, then turn right back around and make those same rules her bitch. So <laughs> in a way she set me and I'm sure countless other young poets free. Um, Kim also has a tireless dedication to making poetry as accessible as possible. Her own poems push every boundary, but never in a way that locks any type of reader out. And in addition to her own teaching, her poetry manual, The Poet's Companion, is one of the best entry points to the craft for any beginner. Kim's poetry is visceral, unapologetic, darkly funny, and untamable. So it was fascinating to peek behind her verses and into her own experiences with her collection of essays, Bukowski and Address. And Mortal Trash, her latest book of poems, is yet another powerful example of why she is a poet to be feared in a publishing industry that worships at the altar of all things safe. So please join me in welcoming Kim Adonizio. Well, thanks so much for that. You're um, making me sorry I ran out of shot glasses before I got here. <laughs> I made these little Bukowski and a sundress shot glasses, but they kind of went fast. So um, I think what I'm going to do, because I have two new books, is start with a poem, read to you a little bit from the memoir, and then uh, go back and close it out with a poem. And things are going to start kind of dark, but, you know, like all darkness, it's going to give way to light. So bear with me and please don't run screaming from the room as we start out. Um, the other thing that's, this is really special to me also because I was born in D.C. and I grew up in Bethesda. And, uh, and so it, it feels really great to come back to my hometown and be here and, and also see there's this big thriving bookstore here that really makes me happy and excited. And, um, and I've got some family here also and some good friends. And uh, my brother Gary is here. I think my sister-in-law is somewhere here. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe my dog-in-law, my nephew dog-in-law, Sammy. Anyway. Um, so it's and and Rob, who's also like my other brother from another mother. So, um, yeah. So I'm going to start out actually, as I said, a little bit in, in darkness, and um, and this is an elegy from my brother John. Elegy for John. The lighthouse beam sweeps over me. I never trusted the sea always shoving into coves, scattering salt glyphs over tourist hotels, smashing trawlers and rowboats to sticks. I keep finding myself beside it, wishing it would turn into a lake with maybe a dock floating close to shore. If not a lake, then a river between canyons. If not a river, then a big moonlit piano stocked with fish. Play irretrievably with the lid closed, Satie wrote on one of his scores. But I never discovered which one or how the music sounded. But this is one way it might go, on a beach where ugly kelp and a yellow piano key are flung from the ocean. I wish the earth had waited a little longer before swallowing my brother. I wish the sea would stop swallowing his name while it goes on kissing the sand, laying another cold wreath at my feet. And, uh, you know, I thought I would read, I thought I would read family stuff since, you know, since my family is here. So this is, uh, the, the book is kind of diverse. And, and so it's hard to ever know kind of what to read to people because there's some comic pieces, there's things about family, there are things about sex and love, um, and sex and, yeah, and, <laughs> and whatever else we call it. And, uh, and then there's stuff about writing, of course, because it's confessions from a writing life because my life is so intertwined with my writing that it's really hard to separate them. So I thought I would read this family piece. And again, this is going to be um, kind of dark. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excerpt from it so that there's time to read you a little bit from uh, another piece in the book as well. It's called Simple Christian Charity. The subject heading of the email in my inbox is just my oldest brother's name. 
In the instant before I open the email, I anticipate what it will say. I'm sorry to be writing you with the news that your brother died tragically. I imagine the possibilities, accident, illness, or possibly, in fact, likely, suicide. I also anticipate my feelings in the following order, relief, a flicker of loss, and then whatever the emotional equivalent of a shrug might be. Shit happens, whatever, he's dead, good riddance. What the email actually says is this. Hi, Kim. I went to school with your brother. I've been talking with him once a month or so. He has lost almost everything and is trying to get some government benefits. He has had some teeth pulled because he cannot afford to have implants. He is depressed over his new predicament. He has moved to blank. I am including his phone number. Please give him a short call. I think it would mean a lot to him. Thank you. Sincerely, Walter Morris. My feelings now occur in this order. Disappointment, a flicker of sympathy during which I entertain the idea of dialing the phone number Walter Morris has provided. Then I remember the last phone message I got from this brother. I hate you, you fucking bitch. Don't pretend like there is anything between us. Fuck you, don't ever contact me again. That was seven or eight years ago during a brief per period I was working on forgiveness, which was supposed to free me from the past. <laughs> During that period, I talked to my brother on the phone, or rather he talked to me about his mentally ill life and whoever he believed was persecuting it, him. When he decided that person was me, the forgiveness experiment ended, and I realized that the best way to free myself was to change my phone number. I was in California, a continent between us, and unless he chose to look me up and come out and find me, Possible, though not likely, given the money and engineering it would take to get him out of the pot-wreathed condo in Bethesda our mother had bought him before she died, I could pretty much write him off. I had three other better brothers. Now apparently he has moved out of the condo. This is condo number two. He accidentally burned down condo number one, apparently from falling asleep on the couch with a lit joint, or possibly a cigarette. The fire spread to two other units in the building. There was a lawsuit and some insurance claims to settle, which our mother took care of. From the real estate situation, you can guess what kind of relationship my mother and oldest brother had. Without my needing to provide more examples, like a few totaled in new cars, and endless checks made out to him, first in her excellent penmanship, and later in the tentative, shivery scrawl of Parkinson's and dementia. Even after she died, the checks, written now by a lawyer, continued for a time. But apparently the well has finally run dry, and my brother is again in need of help. The phrase in Walter Morris's email that catches my attention is his new predicament. This suggests they have been in touch for a while, long enough for there have to been long enough for there to have been several previous predicaments. Whichever one, for example, landed my brother in a small town in North Carolina. I Google it and find it's the fastest growing city in the state, yet offers the serenity of small town living. Not anymore, I'm thinking, they're going to have to strike serenity and add some antonyms, agitation, turbulence, violence. Again, I could provide a few examples, some of which I've used in my fiction. In a short story, I, de I describe a brother who often attacks his sister. Once he tries to choke her and ends up kicking her repeatedly as she lies on the kitchen floor. He hears voices. He burns down his condo and the fire spreads to two others. Fiction comes partly from scraps of life stitched together in new patterns. Trouble and conflict are its engines and he is some of the trouble I've experienced in my life. And then I'm going to skip forward um, the part where um, I, I talk about thinking about calling him, which feels like simple Christian charity. My brother found God at one point. And, uh, and then I make some snarky remarks. <laughs> I can't talk. Sorry. I'm nervous because my family is here. Um, so then I make some snarky remarks about his shitty poetry. <laughs> And <laughs> I'm going to skip those, but they're in here. And so then I'm going um, to I'm going to move on and, and read you to the to the end of the piece. I forward Walter Morris's email to my brother Gary, who, like everyone else in our family, hasn't spoken to him in years. A minute after I press send, my phone rings. 
Don't answer the guy, Gary says. I've heard from a social worker who's trying to unload him on anyone she can. Apparently, our brother had sold condo number two and run through whatever money he'd made. The social worker had found him a place and a roommate, but he lost the roommate after some sort of violent altercation. I'm not sure what happened, Gary said. Someone hit someone with something. This sounded like my older brother's M.O. He'd once cracked me over the head with a 7-Up bottle. There was more news. He had cancer at some point. He had a kidney removed and can't walk anymore. This makes me remember an earlier report, a couple of years before, about him needing a cane to get around. He beat a taxi driver with it. Now he's in some kind of public housing, living on food stamps. In a few months, he'll have to leave and will have no place to go. When the social worker called Gary, she said, everyone I've talked to wants nothing to do with him. When I used some of my experiences with this brother in my fiction, I thought of it, in a way, as payback. Writing as redemption. The writer gets to shape the story to remake events. There's a power in that, a sense that you can undo or at least mitigate whatever wrongs you've endured. The other party is powerless to stop you. You're telling it, and you can say whatever you want to, need to. But my brother has had his own payback. Call it God's will or karma, or the life he's made or been subject to because of bad brain chemistry and co-deparent parenting. That black tornado inside him flattening his chances for love, for health, crushing his talent for music and sports. When his condo burned, so did the tennis trophies he'd accumulated over years of tournament play, gold-plated men melting into their pedestals. Payback, as it turns out, isn't what I'm after. My writing is about my own life, a part of which includes a brother who loomed large in my childhood, whose swath of destruction cut through our entire family, changing whatever, whoever, we might have been. I don't mourn that imaginary family, the one in which I'm not hiding in the closet or sneaking out to the car with my other brothers to leave behind the one who will ruin the outing, the one in which my parents lose the constant worry and my mother isn't being belittled or attacked. There's no point mourning what never existed. Whatever we give in, we use, or else it destroys us. My brother terrified me then, and there wasn't a lot I could do about it. I ran away to my best friend's house once in junior high, but I came back after several days because her parents wouldn't let me stay. When I returned, I tried to confront my mother about what was happening. But confrontations were not anyone's forte, except for my oldest brother and father, and those always involved fists. My mother's advice was this, stay out of his way, we can't control him. She was washing the dishes, washing her hands of me. I felt like I was headed for Golgotha. Then I left home for good at 17 and eventually made a creative life for myself. I think it would mean a lot to him. Maybe it would, but I'm not going to call my brother. I care what happens to him, and I'm sorry his life has been one long predicament, but I'm free of him now. As a child, I thought I would feel forever the way he made me feel, ugly, worthless, afraid. I didn't know that bad experiences could be outgrown, that you could learn from them the harsh lessons life sometimes imposes and move on. Although maybe I caught a glimpse one night in high school when he was fighting with our father. It was the usual, fuck you punk, fuck you two old man. The two of them lunging at each other, our mother in the middle trying to stop them, the kitchen door left hanging from one hinge. I ran outside into the rain and hid behind the crab apple tree in our front yard, waiting for it to be over. I could still hear them yelling inside, and as usual, I worried for my mother, caught between them. It was hot out despite the downpour. I stood under the canopy of branches, the buds in full pink flower, the branches webbed with sticky white caterpillar cocoons. I thought I might go ahead and sleep there if the grass beneath the tree stayed dry. My parents would eventually go upstairs to sleep, I knew, but was, it was harder to predict what my brother would do. He'd pulled me out of bed before, enraged that he couldn't find his tennis shoes, and slammed me against the wall a few times. So I thought it best to stay put for a while. A few minutes later, the front door burst open and my brother ran out. He stopped and stood in the driveway for a minute. Then he doubled over and fell to his knees, moaning, clutching his stomach. 
It was the onset of the ulcerative colitis that would compromise his health the rest of his life, that would lead to operations, heavy cortisone, a colostomy bag. His muscular, stocky body would grow thin and wasted. His face would get puffy from the cortisone. He would lose everything dear to him. Of course, no one knew that then. What I knew that night was that my big bad brother was on his knees in the rain, moaning like a wounded animal, and all I felt for him was pity. Okay, I swear it's gonna get lighter now. <laughs> Cause how could it not? So um, I'm going to read you a little bit of a piece about writing, which is titled How to Be a Dirty, Dirty Whore. And um, I should just mention that the etymology of, of the word whore, actually um, part of the etymology is the word charis, which means deer. So it's a very paradoxical word, as it turns out. And this is you know, really sort of about how, um, well, you'll see. It's, again, it's, this is about writing and life being all mixed in together. So how to be a dirty, dirty whore. And you don't have to take notes. It's right here if you're interested. <laughs> Steal a bottle of Four Roses bourbon from your parents' liquor cabinet behind the bar in the rec room one night when they have forgotten to lock it. Your parents are upstairs in their bedroom, three split levels away, falling asleep in front of Johnny Carson. They have no idea what goes on in the bowels of the house. Call your friend Wendy and ask her to sneak out of her boarding school up the street and join you. Your parents almost named you Wendy, a terrible name, but Wendy is cool. She's been having sex for two years and she's only 15. You, of course, are still a virgin. Invite boys. The boys are friends of one of your brothers and friends of Wendy's, and you are nothing to them because you can neither supply them with pot like your brother nor give them blowjobs like Wendy. At least, that's what you think is happening in the laundry room while you sit gagging down sips of bourbon on the built-in bench beneath shelves filled with your mother's tennis trophies, silver trays and mugs and loving cups, miniature gold statuettes serving tennis balls the size of frozen peas. You do not want to be like your mother, achieving early and astonishing athletic success, shaking hands with British monarchs and dating movie stars, and then getting married and having a bunch of useless, unruly children. You want to be Wendy, a hard-drinking, cock-sucking beauty with creamy skin and really good hair. These are the first stirrings of ambition. It's in little sections. Bring flowers to your best friend, Marie, when you pick her up after her abortion. You are 17 and still a virgin. You and Marie cut school frequently. You drive out River Road, past the mansions stranded on enormous green lawns, stoned and eating pastries stuffed with red jelly, laughing like battery-powered witch puppets. She has been sleeping with her boyfriend since she was 12, but now they have broken up. She doesn't want to have a baby. No one you know wants to have a baby. Not yet. Go to a bar in Georgetown carrying the fake ID that says you are 22. There you will meet Chris, and Marie will meet Dave. Chris is the smart one. Notice that this is how you think. The smart one, the dumb one. Whereas with girls, you think the pretty one, the dog. He is your first. It hurts and takes forever, and the whole time neither of you can stop laughing. The two of you sound like a sitcom, short bursts of guffaws and quiet chortles and occasional gut-busting hooting and howling. You will forget about Chris for many years until his friend from law school, who became your second, gets in touch to let you know Chris has died. Notice how you feel, like time has folded back on itself, a piece of paper on which is written, my first lover. Then the words are erased with whiteout and a tiny brush. Your friends George and Holly are older and more sophisticated. They introduce you to Balzac, Nabokov, Andre Gide, Anis Nin. You sit with Holly in the Café de Paris, drinking Pernod, feeling that life is full of amazing possibilities. You read Nin's diaries and dream of becoming an artist, a woman who has affairs and writes erotica. George and Holly have a friend in California who is a poet. There is a world of artists out there, and you want to be part of that, but you don't know how. You begin keeping a journal. And there's more, but that's where I'm going to stop with that. And I'm going to um, close it out with one more poem from Mortal Trash. 
and uh, then you know if you have questions or we can chat and um, and then afterwards I will be thrilled to sign books for you so as will any author never you know, this is one big secret sometimes people come up come up and say uh, would you mind signing your book and it's like uh, would, you, would you mind if I just gave you $7 million? <laughs> no, well, let me think about that for not at all. So, uh, yeah, writers never mind signing their books. We're always just, like, so happy to have people read our work and to know that it's going out there and maybe somebody will, will get something from it. So n don't ever, you know, hesitate to approach an author and ask for a, a sign, a, a signature. Um, so I'm going to close with this one, again, just because my family's here and there's, there's so much that I'm sure they're recognizing about this. This is called Florida. And then there was the man who said, you look fatter with your clothes off. And like a fool, I didn't put them back on, but climbed into his bed beneath the little Tibetan prayer flags and several images of Buddha haloed by a white light I wished at that moment to dematerialize into, especially when he asked me to get on top, but facing away from him, so that I rose up and slid down, looking at the knees and naked feet of someone whom an hour ago I'd found attractive. In a way, I realized it was now a blessing not to have to look into his eyes. <laughs> but still, being fucked backwards while facing a stain on the wall that resembled Florida was not quite the encounter I'd envisioned standing in the bookstore that the Beats with their Blakeian visions and wholly passionate excesses had made famous. And my mind began to wander in order to avoid being present for whatever was going on down there. Eternally, it felt, and was that really his penis, it felt like a speculum as he groaned and I gazed at Florida, thinking of orange groves and all the nights in Pompano Beach, my brothers and I played lighthouse tag, dodging the beam that swept over the black sea and pale sand. And of all the days I spent shirtless, climbing palm trees or squatting with a stick over a washed up blue translucent man of war quivering in the wind, and of the time I dug a sand pit, hoping to trap my crazy, violent older brother, anchoring the sharp swords of sticker plants upright in the bottom, covering the hole with a blanket and just enough sand. And how was I going to lure him in there? Maybe I could get him to chase me. He was always chasing me. I could feel my anger and the great happiness of impending revenge, imagining him falling in, wishing I could cover him over and bury him forever. While well, somewhere in the orange-scented light of a candle in the universe behind me, my lover finished and I closed my eyes and never until now turned around to look at him, sinking beneath the surface of the bed like a drowning sailor thrown overboard from a great ship that centuries ago rounded the Cape and sailed on to another world. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks. And I th they think they said something about using the microphone for whoever has a question as well as me, right? Okay, yeah, so if somebody has a question, I guess the mic is going around somewhere, like Dr. Phil or Oprah or... Hi. Yes, hi. My name is Lisa. I was wondering about writing about events that were painful. Um, I listened to your reading and found myself feeling very grateful, um, although my own life has had some difficult experiences. Uh, people who've accompanied me through some of that sometimes say, you know, you, you really should write. And I think to myself, why would you want to remember any of that? I mean, you know, in, in, that, in that very deep way that writing about it in a, in a meaningful way brings it back. I mean, it's not that I've blocked everything out of yeah. my life. Yeah. But um, the idea of spending a good part of it in the, those places strikes me as a decision that's difficult to make. How, how do, do you 
How did you make that decision? What, why is it something that you want to do? Yeah, well, I, I think there are two parts to that. One is that being a writer, I write about the things that affect me. And so, uh, and obviously life is light and dark for all of us. And, you know, we've all got holes in our life and we all have things that we've, we've dealt with because that's the nature of life, you know. So being a writer, that's one way that I deal with those things is actually to write about them. And there is a sense, uh, as I said a little bit in the essay, there's a sense of empowerment in that, that, that I can tell my story. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and, the, and the other thing is that also, I think in telling my story, if I'm only just telling it for me, then I'm just being a narcissist. And, and you know, I think if you write it well enough and you tell it in the right way, what happens is it can connect to other people and to whatever pain they've gone through. And I'm not the only person in the world who dealt with a mentally ill family member right. um, or, or friend or the only person who's, who's grown up with violence or the only person who ever, on the other side, fell in love and felt amazing about it and, and maybe lost that love or, you know, so all of that is just our human state. And, uh, and that's what writers do. I think they write about being human. So that's the writer part of the answer. And, may, and it's also mixed in with the sort of therapy part because um, there is a thing about what is inside you. Getting it outside of you so that you can look at it in some way is actually very good therapy and very cathartic in some ways. So to write about it, whether or not you're trying to publish it or get it out in the world, just to get it out of yourself can be really helpful you know, and, and not being silent, but, but telling the things that have happened. So I think that's the part of it. Um, and that's why a lot of therapists use writing in their practice. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference, of course, between writing as an art form and writing as therapy. But they share that intersection, you know, that um, it would be a lie to say that writing is not therapeutic. Of course it is. You know, that's why I do it. And yet at the same time, I don't consider that therapy. I consider it my art. And fortunately, it, it also helps me, you know. So I guess that's the, the sort of two-pronged answer to that. Yeah. And then, then I just have a comment, which is that I think it does what you are intending it to do. I mean, it really reaches someone. You know, when I, when I read the titles of your books and just the back, I mm -hmm. thought to myself, maybe this person is going to be about shock value. But I, right. uh, because your experiences are so... big, for lack of a better word, um, you really don't go over the top. I mean, you say it the way it is, and it, it reaches people, and it's big, but it's not because you're overdoing it. That was my yeah. impression. Yeah, well, that's the craft of it, you know, I mean, because it's not, I mean, I have another essay in there about finding a mouse. So it's like a small subject, but, uh, you know, a lot of it is how you write about it, and so the things that happen to you, whether they're large or small, they're all our experience of life. You know, life is not always peak moments, right? In fact, you know, a lot of it is sort of the daily. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's all it is. It's finding a way to say it that makes it artful and interesting to other people. And then also the other piece of it for me is that, uh, you know, humor is really important to me. I, I actually grew up in a very funny family. Uh -huh. My mother was very funny. My my brother Gary is very funny, and uh, you know, or at least we think we're funny <laughs> to each other. We have the same sense of humor. <laughs> and for those that don't, they're like, "What are you talking about? I don't think that's funny at all. I think that's kind of offensive or stupid." But but we think we're funny, and uh, and I humor. You know, I think the best humor, like if you look th comedians, the best humor to me is the dark humor, yeah. and and keeping that perspective. And I think of Lenny Bruce, who was very funny, but then lost his perspective as his legal problems got more and more intense and he started his performances just being about his sense of persecution and he lost that balance you know so I think it is a balance of of you know you can't walk around being crushed all the time I mean you can but it's not a fun place to be mm -hmm. so what do you have to combat that and you know and humor is a great tool and yeah, that humor yeah. is a great way to to realize that life is absurd and we all deal with all, I mean, uh, you know, hello, guess what? You're going to die one day. Well, shit, right there. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. What's the deal? It's, you know, so, so right away you have to start uh, figuring out why, why it's worth living and why it's worth being here and doing all the things that we do if, if that's the end of things. Yeah, it's true. And unless I you're a Buddhist in which it's all fine, I guess. <laughs> but I'm not one of those people, so. 
My, my daughter's anyway, telling me I've had enough time at the mic. Okay, yeah, so I, you know, if somebody else wants to um, ask something or say something. Oh, hi. hi. Wow, this is like so cool. Yeah, it's like ping pong. Yeah. Um, my name's Liz, and I want to thank you very much for your reading. And just a, a curious as to how you came to writing and, you know, with a very athletic parent, and like you said, you kind of reacted to that. But I wasn't sure, you know, did you come to it from an early age or... Is it something that came around? Like, I guess for Ann Sexton, she came to it a lot later through right. therapy. and. Yeah, yeah. I came to it, well, I came to reading first, which is one thing in the making of a writer is that you fall in love with reading, right? Mm -hmm. Just like anything, you fall in love with something and then you kind of want to do your version of it. So I, I really came to reading first, and that was partly because I did grow up in a big sports family. And, um, you know, we had a lot of televisions and there were sports on every one. And I would walk around the house turning the TVs off and I'd walk back in and they'd be on again and some football game or whatever would be on. So I think I, um, you know, I did like to play tennis, but and I sort of grew up on a tennis court with a mother who, you know, was world champion, four times national champion. So she was a big, you know, she was a big deal and she had really reached the pinnacle of her sport. And... Uh, and I think I found in books what I wasn't finding in my family, you know, because I liked playing, but I wasn't that interested in sports or competing. And so I found books. And But then I went off and wanted to be a musician for a long time. And it, it was my late 20s that I ran across poetry. And suddenly that Emily Dickinson thing, you, you know it when you feel like the top of your head's being taken off. And that's what I felt when I encountered Sylvia Plath for the first time. So, and I talk about that a little in the book about my father reading to me when I was little and about sort of coming to poetry and finding it. So, uh, or it found me. I really think it found me. That was just how it was. You know, um, it's one of those things that I don't think I could have avoided no matter what happened. And and when I found poetry, I, I had been studying flute very seriously, classical flute, and I had dropped out of music school and was trying to go back with a with flute uh, after having, bit, you know, just crashed and burned trying to be an opera singer, which is really talk about the absurdity of life. But um, but I kind of washed out of music school, took up the flute, and was trying to get good enough to go back and get a degree in music. And then I ran into poetry, or vice versa. And at that point, I said, well, clearly this is an art form. And there I was practicing flute three hours a day, every day. And I knew what discipline it took to get good at a musical instrument. So I said, well, this is an art. It must take that commitment to get good. So I think I'm going to quit music and, and learn how to do this thing, which is going to take me you know, as much discipline as as I was applying to music. And so that's what happened. I just left music and decided to be a poet at that point. I imagine that you'd seen discipline in your family as well, even though it was around athletics, right? There was, well, you know, my mother was a great example of, of uh, persistence and determination. And, you know, she was on the cover of Time once and they called her like a young American girl with a terrifying determination to win. And, so, and she had that. So while she wasn't necessarily, you know, around that much or nurturing in a certain way. Um, and that's only part of the story, you know, right? Because of course she's also, we had a, a wonderful relationship in a lot of ways, um, but there, there's that two-sided thing. So um, she was a great example of being a woman who went after she wanted and achieved something by it and with a lot of work and just incredible determination to succeed. So I'm sure I got that from her. And I'm sure my daughter, who's now a, an actress who's becoming very successful, got that from me. Because although I hope she also got the other stuff that I didn't get from my mother, right? Because you know, if you have kids and you have certain kind of parents, you know, your thing is like you want to try to be a different parent than they were, and you're saying I don't want my kid to feel about me certain things that I felt about my parents, and so you're always trying to um, balance that and teach them and also hold them, you know. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. You too. Thank a you. We met um, <laughs> Amy and Bob and Sam, their little dog, last night at dinner. <laughs> we were sitting at the next table, and it was it's so lovely of you guys to show up today. Well, thank you for inviting yeah. us. <laughs> um, I was wondering, as, as we discussed, I'm writing a book as well, and how do you balance the um, how do you balance that sense of of analyzing relationships and and really uh, and bringing out what it is you want to write about 
with how do you balance that with your personal relationships with your family and your friends? Like, has that impacted, you know, every time they say something, are they kind of like, oh, God, is this going to end up in one of her books? Like, how yeah. does, you know, how do you negotiate that tightrope? Because I, I'm creating something I think is going to be fairly, um, I, I think it's valuable, but I think it's going to be very uncomfortable for, and to some of my closest friends and family. And right. Like, how do you deal with that? Right. Well, I mean, it's a question that comes up a lot, and every writing student I've had has asked the same thing and been concerned about it. So, it's a, you know, it's a very real question. And, and, um, and I, I think that part of the answer is that it's, it's your story, and you have a right to tell your story the way that you see it. And I think part of that is also being aware of kindness, being aware that you don't want to hurt anyone, but you do have a right to tell your story. And, uh, you know, if that's going to hurt someone else, then you you weigh that and you consider it. You know, whether you want to vet a chapter with someone and say, look, I'm writing a book, you're in it, and, and this is what I wrote or this is what I'm writing about, and, um, you know, are you going to hate me forever? Or, you know, this is how writers work because we take things from our lives and sometimes transform them in certain ways. Not as much with a memoir, but I've also written novels and books of stories. And there are bits of my life in there, but I've also, you know, the characters in there are, are, might sometimes be based on real people, but they're not those people at all. And, and it helps if people understand how writers work, that you're sort of like a magpie pulling from different places. And even with nonfiction, you're trying to tell a story, mm -hmm. which is your story or your vision of, of whatever it is, you know, that you're writing about, um, whatever kind of book that is. And so uh, that's got to come from you. And, and it's a balance like anything. You know, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but, you know, unless they're an asshole. And, and in that case, you know, like they've probably hurt yours. And, and it's not like you're trying to get back, but, but you can't let them shut you down. And, and, and tell you what to write or tell you you can't write something because that's just, you know, if that happened, well, nobody would ever say a word because, you know, in life, there's always people who are going to like you or not. And are you supposed to stop being yourself because some people aren't going to get who you are or like who you are? That's just, that's the way it is. So I think if you apply that to writing, it kind of carries through. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know how our time is, and uh, is anybody? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Kim, for reading. Is what she said. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm, I'm repeat. It's too bad I got a little doll in in uh, Italy that repeats everything you said. And if I'd only brought her, it would have been like, thank you, Kim, for reading. It's really funny. Okay, so no, no, just ask, I'm sorry, ask away. Okay, so, um, as you know, I'm married to Kim, who's a writer. Um, I do write poetry as well. Um, and I just had a look at the a poem of mine recently where um, it, was, it was a memory. And so it was the first draft. And she practically cut off the first half and said, start here. And I was wondering um, about <laughs> your process, um, because what you read today was like recent memory. Yeah. I was wondering whether you write out everything and then you distill, distill. I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Now. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to do it. That's one kind of process is just getting it all out and distilling. And there's definitely a lot of distilling that goes on. And, and it does have to do with finding where the real heart of your piece is. And sometimes we just write along not really knowing. And then we get to a thing that's like, oh, well, wait, here's the heat. Here's the place where I really start to say what I need to say. And that's often a good place to start. And, uh, you know, and it's the first thing that, that people are starting out writing learn is, is that thing about, as the Faulkner said, you have to kill your darlings. And then not everything you write is brilliant. And, you know, whatever you wrote last night is today is, you know, maybe not as great as you thought it was. And so that's just a continual process, I think. And again, it's a part of the craft is learning how to do that and learning what works and what doesn't. And be learning all the things about language and about story that you need to learn to tell it. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, okay. Hi, Kim. I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between the poems and the memoir and the novels and the seeds of them and whether it's like a chapter where for a moment you're more interested in one thing and less interested in something else 
or if there are easels all over the place and you're working on all of them at the same time. Uh, I'm a poet and I write poetry and I write about poetry and you know the poetic sensibility just seems so overwhelmingly sweet and wonderful uh, and you know yet if you want to make a life as a writer uh, anyway it, I, I'm starting to feel pulled in directions other than just the poems yeah uh, well, I started as a poet, and I remain a poet, but I also got interested mm-hmm. in other f- genres along the way, uh, which took me a lot longer to figure out, but I guess I, I seem to just, I, I, maybe this is true of everyone, you know, you like a challenge, and, and so I was always challenged to write something else or try another form. Um, and it does take a long time to learn the requirements of another form, but poetry is great training for whatever you go on to write because it teaches you about language, imagery, metaphor, rhythm, all the things that make good prose, but doesn't teach you how to create a character uh, or how to figure out a plot. Right. And those are tougher things to learn and you have to really learn those things if you're gonna switch genres and, and understand how to do that. And most of how I learned other genres was reading right. and just saying, well, how did they do that? and trying to figure it out Uh, I just and also getting feedback you know getting feedback on my work and uh, having somebody say start here (laughs) no forget I remember I read something once and a writer friend of mine read it and on about four pages in the middle that happened to be about my therapy she wrote blah 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 (laughs) and this was a good friend of mine and she was right and she did me the service actually of I knew she didn't mean it in a mean way I knew she meant this is not interesting and you, you need to make this more interesting if you're going to speak to anybody but yourself. Mm-hmm. So, so learning that, you know, is, is difficult. But, um, you know, that's, it's fun, too, yeah. or, we, or we wouldn't do it. Well, it I just want to thank you, you for being yeah. such a great and inspiring teacher as well as, uh, as, well as uh, writing things that we're excited to read. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, we're, oh, okay. I just didn't want to run over where we're all going, okay, uh, I'm hungry now. Quick question. Yeah. Um, How do you balance um, presenting your own voice through your writing versus staying neutral? I don't think I am neutral. I don't think writers are neutral. I mean, I'm not a journalist happily. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to just, you know, tell a story from different sides. I'm, I'm just telling my version of it. You know, so I, I don't think I'm neutral at all. I think I'm very much invested. And if I'm not invested, I don't know anybody else would be. And even if I am invested, it doesn't mean other people are going to be interested. So, you know, uh, there's that. But do you mean something else by neutral? Or is, is there something else behind that that you're sort of asking about? Or Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, I think people are ready to buy books, <laughs> and I'm ready to sign them. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, you know, come up and talk to me, unless, yeah. Well, I just mean afterwards. Just come talk to me, and we'll chat. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.